Okay, so uh, thank you very much for the uh, invitation and the introduction, Francesco. It's a, a great pleasure to be here today. Um, actually, my, my paper that Francesco uh, talked so nicely about, that was published a little over 25 years ago. Um, so it, it's been a long time. But when Francesco asked me to uh, come and give this keynote, he actually invited both me and my wife, Mary Sheeran. So Mary is also a researcher in functional programming. There are no side effects in our household. <laughs> <laughs> and our son is a Haskell enthusiast, believe it or not. So the first time, the first version of this talk, uh, we gave together in London. And uh, Mary's not able to be here today, but nevertheless, uh, quite a lot of what I'll be presenting has to do with her experiences as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a kind of whirlwind tour of some of the important ideas in functional programming, um, pick out some of the landmark papers, but also point to some of the work that has inspired myself and Mary over the years. So it's a kind of personal retrospective on functional programming. So of course, my paper 25 years ago was not the start of the subject, not at all. Functional programming dates back to the 1940s. But back then, it was rather different. Back then, functional programming was very minimalist. For example, Booleans. Who needs them? What can you do with a Boolean? All you can do, really, is make a choice. Well, we can define functions to do that. So let's define true and false to be functions that make choices. If you're going to make a choice, you have to have two things to choose between. So Let's give them two arguments. And now we'll just say that true is the function that chooses its first argument, and false is the function that chooses its second. I'm going to use Haskell notation here for a lot of the talk. Uh, so this is just a function with two arguments, x and y, returning x. I hope that it's familiar enough um, that there won't be any problem understanding it. So if we define Booleans like this, then we can define if, then, else as a function. Here it is. What does it do? It takes a Boolean and a then branch and an else branch, and it just calls the Boolean and uses it to make a choice between the then and else branches. So that's great. We don't need Booleans. How about that? Well, what else might you want in a programming language? Maybe numbers, integers. But who needs those, really? I mean, what is an integer for? I'm going to talk about positive integers here, but what is an integer for if not counting loop iterations? <laughs> so why don't we define integers just to iterate a loop so many times? Let's define 2 to be a function that takes a loop body f and a starting value x and just calls f twice. So we execute the loop body twice. And then 1, of course, will execute it once, Zero will execute at zero times, and so on. And there we are. We don't need numbers. We have functions instead. And if we want to recover uh, a normal integer from a function, it's easy to do. So if these are defined in Haskell, then I can turn the function 2 into the Haskell integer 2 just by iterating a loop body that adds 1, starting from the integer 0. So you can see that. All of the information is in these functions. I'm going to be able to extract integer values from them again. And if I make that call, I'll get the Haskell integer 2 as the result. OK, so I can represent integers as functions. But can I do things with them? Well, what do you want to do with integers? Add them together, for example. How will I add two integers? Well, I need to execute my loop body m plus n times. And I can do that by first executing it n times and then executing it m times on the result. So add n n is a function that takes a loop body f and a starting value x and it iterates the loop m plus n times. I wonder if I can do multiplication. How could I execute a loop body m times n times? How about nested loops? If I have an inner loop 
that calls f n times, and an outer loop that calls all of that m times, then in total I'm going to execute f m times n times. So that's great. This gives me a way of adding and multiplying these functions that represent numbers. Does it really work? Well, we can just type into the Haskell REPL, add 1, multiply 2 by 2. That should give us 5, right? And if I use that to iterate the increment function starting from 0, sure enough, I get 5. So we don't need integers either in our programming language. So here's the factorial function. I'm sure you've all been waiting for it. <laughs> the factorial function, Alan 1940. So what does it say? Well, factorial of n, if then else. If n is 0, we get 1. Otherwise, we multiply n by factorial of decrement n. Does it work? Here's factorial of 5. So we can construct that function, which should iterate the increment function 120 times, and yes, it works. Now, there's a couple of auxiliaries that still need to be defined here, like is 0. How can I tell whether a number is 0? Well, what I do is iterate a loop body that returns false n times, starting from true. So if there are 0 iterations, I'll get true. If there's more than 0 iterations, I'll get false. So that's my is 0 function. And the other one I had was decrement. The less said about that, the better. But you can do it. So there we are. We see that Booleans, integers, and actually I've not shown you this, but also any other data structure can be represented entirely by functions. And the man who discovered this was Alonzo Church. These things are called church encodings. So why did Church want to do that? Well, <coughs> excuse me. Church wanted to show that functional programming could be a foundation for mathematics, that you didn't need anything else to build up um, you know, all the rest of mathematics. In particular, you could create Booleans, numbers, and so on. So he had a theoretical interest in this. But um, actually, early versions of the Haskell compiler represented data structures this way. Not <coughs> integers, of course. That would be silly. But data structures were represented by church encodings. Um, there was a, a man called Jan Fairbairn who tried this out first. He wrote his own functional language compiler. He had some new ideas, generated very good code. But he didn't have an implementation of data structures. So he just used the church encodings. And then he could write programs on lists and so on. And they all ran fine. And one day he decided that the compiler was getting sufficiently good that he should really do the work and implement data structures properly. He did that, and the code went slower. <laughs> so this, this used to be the fastest way to implement data structures. That's why the Haskell compiler used to do it. It's not true anymore, because when you run these programs, you're calling dynamically constructed functions the whole time. So it re screws totally with branch prediction. But um, back in you know, around about 1990, branch prediction wasn't so important. And uh, so this was the fastest way to implement data structures. If you want to try this at home, I should warn you. I've shown you Haskell code, and it all works. But uh, if you just type in exactly what I've typed, you get a type error. The type checker says, there's an occurs check. We can't construct an infinite type. OK, that sounds bad. But it's not entirely clear, is it, why it's trying to construct an infinite type. Um, luckily, the type checker tells us, it gives us a, a lot more helpful information. So it tells us the type it was expecting <laughs> and the type that it got. <laughs> And this is actually the first time I've had a chance to use a three-point font on a slide. <laughs> now, I realize that this information may be a little bit daunting. But don't worry, there's more. <laughs> These are the types of all the local variables. So you can't just type this stuff straight into a, a Haskell compiler. You have to give the type checker a little bit of help. And what you have to do is tell it the type of the factorial function. You can do it like this. Now here, the black stuff, that's all stuff that the type checker would be able to figure out for itself. The bit in red, the for all, it can't. So you have to tell it that if you want to try this. Otherwise, everything just works. OK, so this was functional programming in the 40s. 
Um, so Alonzo Church could have a lot of fun writing functional programs, but he couldn't actually run them. It was a bit of a bummer. And that wasn't possible until 1960, when John McCarthy uh, implemented the first version of Lisp. So here's the factorial function in Lisp. And it looks jolly similar. Label means it's a recursive function, and we've got a lambda n, and then cond is if then else in Lisp, and so on. Looks quite familiar apart from all the lovely parentheses. And Lisp was really very advanced. It also had higher order functions. So there was a function called map list that nowadays we call map. And you could map the factorial function down the list, one, two, three, four, five, and get the list of factorials. So you could start doing some real functional programming around about 1960. And at that time, functional programming among um, theoretical computer scientists began to become very, very popular. So Church had already shown that you could implement numbers by functions. McCarthy showed that you could implement Lisp by functions. And Christopher Strachey actually began a whole program of work to show that you could implement any programming language by functions. So what he was doing, basically, he was writing an interpreter for any programming language in the lambda calculus and using that as a way to define what programs meant. And that started a whole branch of programming language theory that continues to this day. But I want to skip ahead a little bit to 1965, when a landmark paper was published called The Next 700 Programming Languages by Peter Landon at UNIVAC. And I'm just going to read you the abstract of the paper. It says, today, 1,700 special programming languages are used to communicate in over 700 application areas. Landon thought this was rubbish. Uh, he thought that it would be much better to have 700, instead of 700 programming languages, just one programming language with 700 libraries for the different application areas. So quite a modern idea. And of course, he thought that one programming language should be his programming language, <laughs> which he called iSwim. It stands for, if you see what I mean. <laughs> and iSwim has been a great influence on um, many functional programming languages that followed. Here's the factorial function in iSwim. But what I really want to emphasize about this paper, it's not just the language. It's the emphasis that Peter Landon put on laws. What do I mean by a law? Well, I mean an equivalence between two different programs that tells us that you can replace one by the other. Here's a law about Lisp programs. Okay, if you take a list and you reverse it, and then you map a function over that, that's the same as first mapping the function over the list and then reversing the result. Well, it's kind of the same. It's the same provided f doesn't have any side effects, which Lisp functions can have. So um, you, often this will be true, but not always. Landon believed that laws are there to be followed, and uh, it, that it's important for programs to satisfy laws like this um, without exception. So he actually discusses in the paper that you might think What's the point of having two different ways of doing the same thing? Wouldn't it be better if these two programs did something different? Because then you could choose which one you wanted. Landon thunders, no. Expressive power should be bid by design rather than by accident. Yes, Mr. Landon. So he put this really strong emphasis on simple laws relating things in programming. That's something that has continued in functional programming ever since. So now I want to skip ahead more than 10 years to another landmark paper uh, by John Backus. John Backus won the Turing Award in 1977. Okay, who is John Backus? Well, everybody's heard of BNF, right? Backus normal form. He invented the notation that we use for grammars. But that's not what he got the Turing Award for. He got the Turing Award for developing the first Fortran compiler. Now, by the time he got the award in 1977, Fortran was the most widely used programming language. It was the programming language that all programming language people loved to hate, because it was just so old-fashioned and full of mistakes. But um, one, one shouldn't let that uh, affect 
one's understanding of what a huge, huge contribution the first Fortran compiler was. So when the Fortran compiler was written, uh, nobody cared about programmer productivity or elegant programs of any, or any of that nonsense. The only thing people cared about was performance. In those days, there were still people who thought that assembly language deprived you of that close connection with the machine that you need to write efficient programs because you could no longer reuse bit patterns from instructions as data if they happen to be the right value. And the reason the Fortran compiler was a success, the first successful high-level language, was that it could consistently generate code better than a human pro pro programmer could write. So, you know, we owe the whole development of high-level languages to John Backus. Now, when you get the Turing Award, you get to give a Turing Award lecture, and you can publish a paper about it. And of course, John Backus could have written about how wonderful Fortran was, or all of the clever things they did to make the compiler so successful. But he chose not to. He chose to write about his new love, functional programming. And his paper is a manifesto for functional programming. And you, I can't overemphasize the impact that that had. If Bjarne Straustra were to stand here today and say, it was all a mistake, I should have designed Erlang, that would not have the same impact as John Backus's Turing Award lecture. The man who gave us Fortran said, it's all wrong. We should be doing functional programming instead. And this paper inspired a generation of researchers to work on functional programming, including myself. If you haven't read this paper, Google John Backus Turing Award today. The PDF is the second hit. It's something everybody should read. At least, the paper is in two halves. The first half is brilliant. The second half are some other ideas that haven't had the same impact. But the first half of that paper is something everyone should read. I'm just going to quote a little bit from the introduction to the paper. Conventional programming languages are growing ever more enormous, but not stronger. Back as is thinking of languages like Ada here. C++ were not, was not even a glint in Strausser's eye at this point. Inherent defects at the most basic level cause them to be both fat and weak. <laughs> you see, it's, it's great stuff, isn't it? It's stirring. <laughs> their primitive word-at-a-time style of programming, inherited from their common ancestor, the von Neumann computer. So yeah, what was he talking about? He explains that a computer has three parts, a central processing unit, uh, a store, and a connecting tube that can transmit a single word between the CPU and the store. And he says, I propose to call this tube the von Neumann bottleneck. Next time you buy a computer, don't ask how fast the bus is. Ask how fast the von Neumann bottleneck is. <laughs> so he was dead against word-at-a-time programming. Their inability to use powerful combining forms for building new programs from existing ones. What's he talking about here? I'm going to show some diagrams to illustrate this idea. So I'm in these diagrams, the boxes are going to represent functions, and they're going to take inputs from the right and generate outputs on the left. So Backus was interested in forms for putting functions together into more complex functions. For example, what he called apply to all and wrote alpha f which replicates the function once for each element of a list. We'd call this map. Um, this was one of the combining forms that he proposed. So that would just map all the inputs in the list to outputs. Here's another one. If you've got four different functions, f1 to f4, then you might make what Backus called a construction. You put them together to get a function that will take its input, distribute it to each function, and then collect the results in a list. So that was another form that he proposed. Their lack of useful mathematical properties for reasoning about programs. What kind of properties is he talking about? Well, let's look at the diagram again. Here is what Backus would write as a construction of f1 to fn composed with g. That dot is function composition. If you think about it, that's going to produce the same results as this. 
right? It doesn't matter whether you apply g to the input first and then distribute it among the f's, or whether you distribute the input first and then, in each component of the construction, apply both the f and the g. So those two programs are equivalent. Here's another one. This is map f, or alpha f, composed with a construction. And that dotted line there illustrates how I've divided up the description of this program in the, syntactically. But of course, it's the same as this, in which we have a construction of four functions, each of which composes f with one of the g's. So what you see here is two of Bacchus's laws about his combining forms. So he's emphasizing laws, just like Peter Landon did. Um, but now they're, they're laws involving the combining forms that he was proposing. So let's look at an example of a program in Bacchus's language, FP. First of all, here's an ALGOL 60 program for computing the <coughs> scalar product of two vectors. And you can see it's word at a time. We pick one element at a time from each array and multiply them together and add them up. So Bacchus would write this instead like this, where the scalar product takes a pair of vectors, transposes them into a vector of pairs, applies multiplication to all, the, all those pairs, and then adds them up using insert plus. And insert is what today we call fold R. Actually, Bacchus wouldn't write it like this. He'd write it like this. I, I think he had a little bit of APL envy. Um, but he wanted his notation to be very, very concise and powerful. So, as I say, this was a, a landmark paper. It had a huge influence on people working in the field. So now I want to move on um, to the early 80s. And another paper that perhaps isn't so well known, but I think illustrates the ideas of functional programming very, very nicely. A paper called Functional Geometry by this man, Peter Henderson. Remember that name. So Peter was actually Mary's PhD supervisor. So we saw this work quite closely. And Peter had two loves, functional programming and the art of M.C. Escher. There you see an example of um, one of Escher's woodcuts, I think. And uh, this one is called Square Limit. And it's got a collection of fish who kind of get smaller and smaller and smaller towards the edges of the picture. And Peter was fascinated by the recursive structure of pictures like this, and he wanted to be able to construct them by writing functional programs. But in those days, if you wanted to do graphics, you would write the sequence of graphics commands for you know, drawing the line sequence and so on, very much word at a time. Peter didn't want to do that. He wanted to work with a whole value, with a picture as a value. For example, this picture. Let's call this one fish. And if you can treat the whole picture as a value, then you can start defining combining forms for putting them together. And this fish actually fits very nicely together with itself. So here's a fish overlaid on a double rotation of the fish. The rotation is through 90 degrees. So double rotation is 180 degrees. It turns the fish upside down. As you can see, they fit together nicely. That's part of Escher's genius. And this fish, you can actually also fit it together if you rotate it through 45 degrees and make it a little smaller. So fish two here is that, that top fish that's been rotated for 45 degrees. And fish three is the one on the right-hand side that's been rotated 270 degrees anti-clockwise. And then you can overlay all those together and you get this little tile with a big fish and two smaller ones. You can even take that smaller fish and put four of them together. You just overlay fish two with one rotation, two rotations, and three rotations, four copies. And you get these nice four fish that might fit in the middle of that picture. And Peter went on to define um, various operations for putting pictures together, like quartet takes four pictures, P, Q, R, and S, puts them together in a square, or cycle that takes a picture and makes three rotations of it and puts those together in a square. And using those, you can go on to make fish pictures of your own. Like this one, for example, this is a cycle of a rotation of that little picture with three fish in. And why not make a quartet of those? So you, this is like Escher wallpaper. So Peter played with these things. These are not actually from Escher's print, but they're similar things. But, but what about the print? Well, to make the print, 
you need to have small fish at the edge. And Peter realized that he could take that little tile with three fish in and put it together in a quartet with two empty pictures, and he'd get something that looked as though it might fit along the edge of the picture. Except he'd really like to make those fish get even smaller. So let's call this picture side one, and then let's just put two smaller copies of side one in the two blank spaces, and so on and so forth. And if you keep doing that, you're going to get these fish getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller towards the side of the picture. You've got to do the same thing with the corner. So you can take this tile and then call that corner one and fill in the blanks with a smaller corner and the side and the rotation of the side and keep doing that and you get corners that, that extend further and further towards the edge. If you keep doing this, finally, you can build up the whole square limit picture by making a non-et, he called it. That's nine pictures arranged in a square. When you combine the corner and the side and rotations of the corner and rotations of the side, and in the middle you have the, one of the tiles I showed you with four fish. There it is. So Peter's paper shows how to draw this picture using functional geometry. There's Escher's print. Pretty good, huh? So this was very, very elegant. Um, but there's one thing I haven't told you. Of course, Peter had to represent the picture somehow. Let's see. How do you think he might have represented a picture? Wait. A function. <laughs> of course. So what he did, and this was, this was very clever. Peter represented a picture by a function that, given three vectors, a, b, and c, would return a list of drawing commands that would draw the picture in the blue box that those three vectors define. And this was very clever because it made it very simple to define the operations for putting pictures together. For example, he's, here's how you overlay p on q. You take your three vectors, a, b, and c, you draw p in the box, you draw q in the box, and you just <coughs> combine the drawing commands that you get. Here's how you put p beside q. Okay, so if we want to draw p beside q in a blue box defined by these vectors, we split the box. And then we say draw p, but we give it b over 2 as it's, you know, to define its box. And we draw q starting from a plus b over 2. So we give the vectors that correspond to the two halves of the box and uh, draw each picture in the right place. And you could even rotate pictures this way. Okay, so if P would be drawn in this box, how do you rotate it? Well, you, you give it that box on the right, where you've moved the point of origin over to you know, the bottom right corner, and then you have to give minus B to make it draw in the same space. So that's also very, very simple. And that made these operations both easy to define and easy to prove things about, which Peter also wanted to do. So here's a law about the picture operations. I haven't shown you above, but you can imagine what it does. So if you put P above Q and then rotate, that's the same as rotating P, rotating Q, and putting one beside the other. And there are many laws of this sort in the paper. Why did Peter care? Because he says, like Landon, it seems there's a positive correlation between the simplicity of the rules of the laws and the quality of the algebra as a description tool. In other words, he used these laws as a touchstone for the design. If he thought of an operator on pictures, but it didn't have any nice laws, he would think again. And I think that helped him reach a very nice design for putting pictures together. So what do we see? We see working with whole values, not a word at a time. That's a key functional programming idea building combining forms for pictures, using the algebra, the laws, as a, a litmus test for a good design, and once again, using functions as representations. And these are ideas that come back uh, again and again. OK, so now I want, to, I want to skip ahead a little to 1994, tell you about a paper that is, which is quite little known, I think, with a very weird title. So this was... Uh, 
a paper written by Paul Hudak and Mark Jones. Paul Hudak was one of the original Haskell designers. He was a, a, a leader in the field of functional programming. And um, in the mid-90s, you couldn't get research money to do functional programming for real programs, of course. But you could get research money to study functional programming for prototyping. So DARPA had a huge program when lots of different groups were developing prototyping languages. Prototyping was, you know, it was hot in those days. It was like, I don't know, microservices or whatever. <laughs> so DARPA had all of these groups working away. And Paul had money to develop Haskell as a software prototyping language. But after they'd been working for a while, DARPA thought, well, let's see how they're doing. Let's give them all a problem to solve, and we'll see how quickly and how productively these various groups can develop a prototype. So this is why the paper has the weird name, because the prototyping languages were, apart from Haskell, Ada, C++, Orc. I'm not quite sure how that got in there. And a variety of others. So DARPA gave the problem to each group. And Mark <laughs> Jones uh, was the guy who got the job of solving the problem in Haskell. And DARPA being DARPA, the problem was a two-dimensional geometry server. And it was supposed to take in geographical information about positions of hostile aircraft and commercial aircraft and so on, and then divide the space up into regions with weird names like weapon doctrine and slave doctrine and engageability zone. That's this, this gray thing, this ring-shaped thing. That's the engageability zone. So the prototype was supposed to read this stuff and then generate output that would say, you know, at time 40, the commercial aircraft is going to be in the engageability zone and in the tight zone, and the hostile craft will be in the carrier-slave doctrine. So <coughs> Mark had the job of implementing this in Haskell. And of course, he needed to represent regions in the plane. Let's see. How might you represent a region? As a function, of course. So Mark chose to say that a region is going to be represented by a function from a point to a bool. And the function will return true for points in the region and false for points outside. And that's very, very simple. It makes it easy to define, for example, a circle. You just take the points, you compute how far is it from the origin, and compare that to the radius. It's easy to compute the outside of a region. You just negate the Boolean. You can compute the intersection of a region. You know, a point is in the intersection of P and Q, if it's in P, and it's in Q. And then you can go on to build up things like an annulus, that is a ring, just by saying, well, an annulus, annulus with a, an inner radius of R1 and an outer radius of R2, it's the outside of a circle with radius R1 intersected with the inside of a circle with radius R2. Well, I think you can see now that Mark probably didn't have to write a whole lot of code. And when the results were reported into DARPA, they looked like this. Now, I appreciate the font is a bit small here, but I'll read the important stuff. So the thing with the red line about it, that is Mark's solution. It's 85 lines of Haskell. And that compares very well with, for example, 800 lines of ADA 9X, or 1,105 lines of C++. So it was far and away the smallest solution. It was also one of the solutions that worked, which the evaluators didn't really believe to begin with. They thought it was just, just a design document. But no, it was actually executable. The annoying thing here is the Haskell was 85 lines. Oh, it's the only functional language in the list, by the way. But Mark liked writing type declarations. He'd actually written 29 lines that the type checker could have inferred for him. So this could have been 56 lines of code. Anyway, so the DARPA evaluators got this stuff, and they thought, there's something fishy here. Uh, this happened because Mark Jones is brilliant, which he is. But um, so they just didn't trust it. So what they did was, without telling Paul or Mark, they found a graduate student somewhere else. And they gave that poor guy one week to learn Haskell, and then gave him the problem. That's why Haskell appears in the list twice. This bottom one is the student solution. It's 156 lines. 
It's almost twice the size of Marx. Well, what can you expect with only a week's experience? <laughs> but it's the second smallest solution in the entire list. So you would think, this is tremendous, right? This is a huge success for functional programming. So how did the evaluators react? It's too cute for its own good. <laughs> Higher order functions are just a trick, probably not useful in other contexts. What can you do? To the list? Yeah. So it says that function is non functional. Why is there some good animation on the list? Yes. And actually, the development time there is very, very good. It's very, very good. Unfortunately, the code didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> There's more behind this. I really recommend looking for this paper, actually. It, to this day, it's a great read. And, and then you'll learn much more. I can only give, you know, a top-level summary. So, so now I want to go back again to an idea that really inspired me, and that is the idea of lazy evaluation. In 1976, two separate papers were published with basically the same idea in them. The first one was called A Lazy Evaluator by Henderson and Morris. Look, remember this guy? It's Peter Henderson again. And the other was by Dan Friedman and David Wise called Cons Should Not Evaluate Its Arguments. And the basic idea in both of them was that rather than computing things, you know, date, like arg function arguments, parts of data structures, when you construct them, you should save the computation until later, until the value is actually needed. So if you're not familiar with lazy evaluation, I think the best way I can explain it is by saying it's like trying to get a teenager out of the house. <laughs> Put on your jacket. I will. <laughs> Put on your shoes. I will. Brush your teeth. I will. We're going now. Oh, wait a minute. That's how lazy evaluation works. So why was it important? Remember, we've been talking about not word at a time programming, but programming with a whole value. Well, with lazy evaluation, the whole value can be infinite. And that opens a whole new world of possibilities. So for example, you can have the infinite list of natural numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, blah, blah. You can have the list of all the iterations of a function, you know, x, f of x, f applied twice to x, and so on. And the key thing here is that you can manipulate these infinite things in your program, but you will never actually compute all of the elements. It's the consumer of this data structure that decides how many elements you're going to compute. And I saw this, and I thought, wow, this is wonderful. This lets you separate the code that defines what you want to compute from the code that defines how much you want to compute. And I had, some years before, uh, been forced to study numerical methods, which I was not very good at. But I realized that I could write a great consumer for numerical methods. Many numer numerical algorithms compute a sequence of approximations, and then they take the first one that is within some tolerance, epsilon of the predecessor. So I could just define this function limit that would take one of these infinite lists and just search down it for the first approximation that is sufficiently close to the one before. And then I could use that to define, for example, a square root algorithm. This is the newton raphson method, uh, where um, you start from some value, I've taken 1.0, and then you iterate a function that gives you the next approximation from the previous one, and you take the limit. Here's how you might compute derivatives. You compute the derivative of a fun function by computing its slope across a small segment. So to compute the derivative at x, you will take the value of f at x plus a little bit, h. Take the difference, divide by h, that gives you the slope. And then the smaller you make h, the more accurate the approximation will be. So once again, if I, if I start off taking h you know, by repeatedly dividing by 2, a map slope over it, I'll get an improving sequence of approximations, and I can just take the limit in the same way. But the convergence check is going to be the same code in both cases. It's only the code for generating the approximations that is different. I thought this was nice. But actually, I also remembered from my numerical analysis course 
quite a clever idea. So I already explained how to compute a derivative, and it depends on this, this value h. But you can also compute integrals by the trapezium rule, which you may remember. And there again, you're adding up the areas of a lot of bars with a particular width. Let's call that width h, too. So you can see that in both these methods, there is this parameter h. And the smaller you make h, the better the result that you get. Well, it turns out that in both cases, the result that you get is going to be of this form, a plus b times some power of h. So here, a is the right answer, and b times the power of h is the error term. Okay, so this is standard numerical analysis. So what if we compute, what if we apply those methods for a value h and half that value? Then we get two approximations to our integral or derivative. And we know they're of this form. So we know these two values, and we've got two unknowns, a and b. Think back to high school mathematics. If you've got two equations and two unknowns, you can solve for the unknowns. So you can figure out what a is. All you need is two approximations, and you can compute the right answer. Isn't that brilliant? So actually, if you compute your, your original sequence of approximations by your original method, then you can take the first two and get the right answer there. But if you take the next two, and so on, you can get a whole sequence of right answers. And it turns out they're not all the same. <laughs> well, that would have been really magic, wouldn't it? Um, <laughs> There is no real magic in the world. But it's almost magic, because that green sequence converges much faster than the blue one. What you've done, I mean, the, the reason it's not exact is that that error term is an approximation. The true error term has you know, a h to the n, but then there'll be a, a larger power of h in another error term. So what we've done here is we've eliminated the first error term, and we get a numerical method with a better order of convergence. And we can just write a function to improve a sequence of approximations by eliminating the error term of order n. And we can write that as a separate piece of code. It's really simple. And then, if we want, for example, a really fast derivative, we can use it more than once. Look, here I've done the basic method to get a sequence of approximations. Then I've eliminated the first order error term. Then I've eliminated the second order error term. This gives me a third order numerical method for derivatives. And I can just take the limit and it'll converge in no time. It works even better for integration, because integration is much slower, so the win is, is much larger. And everything is programmed separately, and I could understand all the parts, as opposed to when I first studied numerical analysis. And it's all thanks to whole value programming and lazy evaluation. So I was very happy with these examples, and these are the first examples in my paper. So if you dig out my paper, you'll find all of this stuff explained in a lot more detail. And the basic idea that I was emphasizing here was that of a, a lazy producer and consumer, where the consumer figures out which values to demand, and then the pr producer generates them in response to the demand. And what we've seen here is um, that you can use a convergence test and a sequence of numerical approximations, but there are many other ways you can use the same idea. For example, the consumer might be a search strategy and the producer a search space. So you can write search programs where one part of the program just builds the whole space without any concern about how you're going to search in it. And the search strategy is independent and can be used on any such space. In the paper, I use this um, to develop a noughts and crosses program. So I implemented the alpha beta heuristic, which is quite sophisticated. And I played noughts and crosses because I had a very small computer. But it was good fun. But um, I used the same idea to develop a pretty printing library, um, which I'll, I'll briefly show you. So here, pretty printing, the problem here is, for example, if, when you print a data structure in the Erlang shell, it comes out nicely laid out. That's pretty printing. Or you might want to take source code and lay it out according to standard layout conventions. So pretty printing is something that there's quite often a need for. But if you've written a pretty printer, you'll know how hard it is to get those darn things right. So I was quite interested in making a library for doing this, where 
I would build a, a lazy search space representing all of the ways you could lay out a document and then have a separate selection criterion that would pick the best layout from that collection. So for example, if you want to pretty print an if-then-else, then you might be choosing between these two alternative layouts, either a horizontal form if it, everything fits nicely, or a vertical one if it doesn't. And often in the vertical one, you want some indentation as well. But of course, you don't want spaces to appear in the horizontal form. So my goal was to write a pretty printer that would write one piece of code that might render like this or like this, depending on, on the context. And I did that by defining document fragments as values. So each document fragment you can think of as a, a, a bit of text and some indentation. That's the red stuff. And then I defined combining forms for putting them together vertically, in which case the indentation would be preserved, or horizontally, in which case the indentation would be discarded. So that's why I had to distinguish the indentation from just ordinary text. And that was, was this less than greater than operator. And then I needed ways to build primitive documents. You convert a string into a document and to add indentation. That's what this nest function do, that I've nested by two spaces. And now if you think about it, there are some nice laws that these combining forms satisfy. So indentation is discarded in a horizontal form. So if I put A beside a nested document, that's the same as just putting A beside B. The nest nesting gets discarded. On the other hand, if A is the thing that's nested, then it doesn't get discarded. B gets put to the right of A without changing the indentation of A. So there are two laws that these things satisfy. Here's another one. If you put three things together horizontally, it doesn't matter which order you do it. If you put three things together vertically, it doesn't matter which order you do it. This one's kind of cool. If you put A above B beside C, you get the same thing as if you put A above B beside C. So even when you're mixing above and beside, you can remove the brackets. But these two are different. If you put A beside B above C, then C ends up indented the same as A. If you put A beside B above C, then C ends up indented more, uh, the same as B. So you get a kind of interesting algebra here um, with many laws that hold and one that doesn't. So then I also defined uh, an operator for constructing documents with more than one possible layout. I just called it separate. Separate A, B, and C by either putting them together horizontally or vertically. And now if you want to write pretty printers, it's very simple to do. Here's a pretty printer for binary trees, which prints a leaf just as a text string and prints a branch by separating. So this might be horizontal or vertical. Branch, a left subtree nested, and a right subtree nested. And those laws, they were actually really important. It's very hard to figure out what a pretty printer should really do. So how did I do it? Simple. In the implementation, those laws are being applied to guarantee that what I produce is a correct output for the code that I started off with. OK, so then I had a heuristic for choosing the layout. I know this was a good idea, because very many distinguished people have improved on it afterwards. So all of these people have fixed some of my mistakes. And among them is our own Richard Carlson, who implemented a library based on these ideas in Erlang. It's in syntax tools. So if you want to play with pretty printing combinators inspired by my paper, just use pretty PR. So I'm probably best known nowadays for QuickCheck. And what does QuickCheck do? Well, you give it a general property of your code. It generates random tests. And if they all pass, it's happy. If you write a property that's not true, it'll generate tests that fail. Here's a list that's not its own reversal. And um, having found a failing test case, then it goes on to search for a simplest possible example, which we call shrinking. And we end up, in this case, with 0, 1. That's the shortest, smallest list that is not its own reversal. Why is it smallest? Well, if you remove either element, you get a list with one element. And that is its own reversal. And if you were to reduce the 1 to a 0, you'd have 0, 0, which is also its own reversal. So this is the smallest list that isn't. 
That's the minimal counterexample. So what, what I just want to point out is that here, the property describes a search space of test cases. So we've got one part of code constructs the space of all possible tests, and quick check search strategy, which is actually a combination of random search to begin with, followed by a systematic search for this smallest example. It's the same idea all over again. I just can't get away from it. I only have one idea, obviously. <laughs> OK, so I, I want to quickly now talk about some of the things that inspired Mary. Um, and that starts with this book, Mead and Conway. Anybody read it? A few people. So this book transformed VLSI design. Before this book, VLSI design meant drawing rectangles on silicon. Afterwards, it was about thinking in a high-level way about how the hardware circuits worked. And Mary was very inspired by that. Um, not least, she was inspired by what's called retiming. So this diagram represents an orange box, which is doing some computation. And the blue circles are one clock cycle delays. So both inputs of this orange box are being delayed one clock cycle. Well, if you think about it, that will do the same thing as this circuit, where the inputs are not delayed, but there's a delay on the output. So what do we have here? We have two circuits that are equal. And Mary was inspired by that. And for her thesis work, she designed a language called MuFP, whose idea was circuits as values. And it was basically back as this FP plus one clock cycle delays. OK, a little more than that, but that was the basic idea. With many of the same combining forms, many of the same laws, and it was especially good for reasoning about this retiming, because there were laws that could be applied to move those unit delays around in circuits, which was otherwise quite hard to get right. Let me show you an example of where that's useful. Here's a circuit, which is a chain of orange boxes that do some computation. And I've just added a whole lot of unit delays. So the inputs are being delayed quite a lot. But now watch. All of the inputs to those orange boxes are being delayed, right? So if I apply the law that I showed you two slides ago, I can move them to the end and just have one delay instead. And now, ignore the leftmost column. All of the inputs to the rightmost three boxes are delayed. So let's apply the law again and do that, and so on. So by applying the law, we can see that the circuit I started off with does the same thing as this circuit. OK, what's the point of that? Well, the circuit I started off with has a long, long combinational path through all of those orange boxes. And that means if you clock the circuit, you have to wait for data to flow all the way from the right-hand side to the left-hand side. And that will take a long time. After applying the laws, you've got delay elements between each box. And that means in one clock cycle, data only has to propagate across one of the boxes. So you can probably clock this circuit four times faster than the original one, which is great. That's why people want to do it. But you have to figure out that you need this triangle of delays on the inputs. And figuring out where to put those delays on the inputs, that's actually quite hard if you don't have this kind of algebra. So Mary even had users for MuFP. Plessy, who are a British electronics company, were designing a chip for um, video motion estimation. It's part of video compression. And they were designing a regular array for that. And they used MuFP. And they said afterwards, using MuFP, the array processing element was described in just one line of code. How's that? And the complete array was only four lines. And MuFP enabled the effects of adding or moving data latches, those delays within the array, to be assessed quickly. So this was great. They wrote a paper about it. And um, this was a nice success for functional programming of hardware. And the next thing that happened was that Plessy were bought by GEC and Siemens, who weren't interested in this at all. They probably thought it was too, too cute for its own good. <laughs> so that, that was the end of that at Plessy, but not the end of functional languages for hardware design. Mary went on to design Lava, which is kind of Mu FP plus functional geometry, you might say. So the key thing there is that it captures the semantics of a circuit, but also the geometry tells you something about the placement. Because when a programmer or when a designer designs one of these regular circuits, he knows it's an array circuit. It should be laid out as an array. If you just generate, give synthesis tools for semantics, they don't know that. 
So here, for example, are four adder trees. Uh, this is an FPGA configuration generated from lava using the functional geometry stuff to give placement information to the tools. If you just say, I want this semantics and use the synthesis tools, you get this. And you, know, you don't have to know much about FPGAs to see this is a dog's breakfast. And because it's a dog's breakfast, it performs much worse. So Satnam Singh, who was Mary's student, worked at Xilinx for quite a long time. And he would build uh, FPGA layout generators for customers. And he'd, he'd write them in lava and give them a Haskell binary. So you know, here's a layout generator for your problem. He never told them what was inside it, though. So they didn't know they were running Haskell code. Once, actually. Uh, he had a problem. One of his generators didn't work because of a bug in the Haskell compiler. So he emailed Simon Peyton Jones at Microsoft Research with the bug report. And the next day, then Simon sent him a, a patch, and he was able to continue. But when he told his boss about it at Xilinx, the boss couldn't believe it. He said, what? You got 24-hour support from Microsoft? While we're talking about hardware, let's talk about Intel. Remember the Pentium bug? Here's an example. So here we're taking two numbers, one starting with four, one starting with three. And what we're doing, we're taking the one starting with four, dividing by the second one, multiplying by the second one again, so that should give us back the first one, subtracting it from the first one, that should give us zero. But on the buggy Pentiums, it was 256. So that was um, not good. And Intel had to replace an awful lot of buggy Pentium chips. It cost them $475 million, which was not enough to sink the coffee, uh, sink the company, but not that far short. And afterwards, they had to do something with the buggy Pentiums, of course. So you know what they did? They put them in key rings, and they gave them to all their employees. <laughs> and on the back of the key ring, it says, Bad companies are destroyed by crises. Good companies survive them. Great companies are improved by them. I've seen one of these key rings. I know uh, this guy, Carl Seeger. So how did Intel improve? Carl Seeger, who was working for them, <coughs> designed their own lazy functional language called FL, which had some built-in proof techniques. And they started designing their processors with functional programming. So this, this system that he built it has thousands of users within Intel. And they used FL as a design language, a specification language, scripting language. They built theorem provers in it. They proved things about FL programs. So why hasn't there been a second Pentium bug? It's thanks to functional programming, in part at least. So functional programming for hardware has, has been a very successful application area that many people don't know so much about. I just want to finish with one last example of that. That is a company called BlueSpec, founded by uh, Arvind, who's a professor at MIT. Arvind was also one of the original designers of Haskell. And BlueSpec is a hardware description language that is purely functional. It's very Haskell-like. You build the architecture of your circuit um, with functional programming. But it's also got some very clever stuff for the low-level part. It uses guarded atomic transition rules. I'm not going to explain what they are. But they're very clever. And they let the compiler find the parallelism that you need on a chip. And then they generate Verilog that goes on into a further chain of synthesis tools. And BlueSpec gets you know, the benefits you'd expect from writing high-level functional programs. Um, the compiler is very good. It often beats handwritten code. It lets designers use better algorithms because they have more time to think. Um, architectural changes and so on are very easy. There's a very nice paper about this. If you'd like to read about this fascinating application, their CTO, Nikhil, um, wrote a paper called Types, Functional Programming, and Atomic Transactions in Hardware Design, which describes all of this stuff. But OK, so we can write Haskell-like functional programs and compile them to hardware. Which program would you compile? Well, for me, it's obvious. Quick check, of course. And they've actually done that. They've made a version of Quick Check, which they've written in BlueSpec, which they can compile onto a chip. 
That is quick check on an FPGA. <laughs> and it generates random test cases on the chip. If they fail, it shrinks them down to a minimal test. And this just blows hardware designers away. They've never seen anything of the sort. You can imagine how incredibly fast the tests run when they're being generated and executed on the same FPGA. So I think that's really, really fun. Well, we've made a long journey here from church numerals in the 1940s to quick check on an FPGA last year. Um, but we've seen the same ideas coming back again and again. The idea of programming with whole values instead of a word at a time. Of using combining forms that satisfy simple laws. And often using functions as representations. I think Bacchus would be proud of us. Thank you.